we, we work with congregations, and I'm, I'm going to show you today why it's so important. It does three things, the foundations for disciples. And the first one is, oh, excuse me. Okay. Did I? Okay. Why is Foundations for Disciples, and what is it, and why is it so vital for congregational growth? For one thing, it uses questions and answers from the Bible. It's not unlike many new Christian training books, but it goes further than, than they do, and we'll go over why. It prepares the congregation for growth. It trains, teaches, and involves and forms good habits for new Christians and as well as current Christians and use as a guide or a tool for church growth. First of all, let's answer this very important question. What is a disciple? Well, in Jesus' day, they would have these great teachers like Gamaliel and Hillel and others, and they would go, they would be called Rabboni, and they would go around, the great ones were, and they would go around and choose their own disciples, and they would pay for the disciples' living expense, and the disciples would basically be their servant and follow them around for a long while. In fact, we know that Paul was a disciple of Gamaliel. He said that he grew up at the feet of Gamaliel. And you had to be from a good family, you had to be a good uh, Jewish student, and you had to be pretty smart and have uh, references. And so to be chosen by Gamaliel, you had to be something special. And that's why John, uh, Paul called himself a Jew of Jews, didn't he? And that he, uh, he, he excelled in Judaism. Now, Jesus chooses us, doesn't he? How does he choose us? Well, it's not who we are, it's where we are, according to Ephesians chapter 1. We are chosen in him. How do we get to be in him? Well, Romans 6 tells us that we are crucified with him and we are buried with him and we are raised with him when you do something with somebody what does that mean well we went to go carrie and i and tell me her name again huh eris eris sally okay <laughs> Says so it's a Sally with an era in front of it, right? Era Sally, okay, okay. Yeah. Anyway, we went to go eat with them, and I can say we actually went uh, to eat lunch with them. They were actually there. We ordered. We sat at the same table. We experienced. We didn't eat the same food, but we experienced the fellowship together. When you are baptized into Jesus Christ, it is not an outward sign of an inward grace, like some people try to say it is. And it is not to join the church, although you're added to the Lord's church. Instead, baptism is joining Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. When you do something with somebody, it means you do the same thing that they do. How many baptisms did Jesus experience? This is just one for you to look up. How many baptisms did Jesus experience? Well, there were two. One of them was when? John's baptism. And what was the second one? He told his disciples that he was going to be baptized. And he said, are you going to be baptized with the same baptism I will be? Now, many commentators uh, like to say that that means the suffering, the baptism of suffering. But you have to understand what he went through, the death, burial, and resurrection was baptism. It wasn't in water, but uh, he, he 
he literally died and was buried and was raised. And he was the, as Isaiah says, he is the father of the everlasting, he fathered the everlasting, or the Bible says everlasting father. But he fathered the everlasting. So in order to be, to, in order to become an everlasting person with Christ living inside of you, you have to die with Jesus you have to be buried with Jesus, and you have to be raised with Jesus. Now, 97% of the world does not teach that. They teach something else, and, and that's the problem. The 97% of the people that call themselves Christians are not Christians. They have never been Christians. They've never been, bad, they've never been buried, died, been buried, and resurrected with Jesus Christ. That's our message to tell them the great news. So when we say, I know you've heard things about Jesus, but I'm dying to tell you the rest of the story. Now, if you say it like that, they'll listen. If you say, you don't want to hear the rest of the story of Jesus, do you? Probably not. <laughs> so you got to be excited about that message. I am. Because I got to die with Jesus, I got to be buried with Jesus when I went into that water, and I got to be raised with Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Aren't you glad that you experienced that? And I don't, are y'all glad about it? Oh, well, good, great. Well, a disciple, we were chosen in him. And we joined him in his death, burial, and resurrection. And now we are his student. Someone once said, uh, or someone said, what is a, uh, what do you call a, a student of ophthalmology? A pupil. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> it gets worse. Peter says in 1 Peter 2 and 21, for this, to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that we should follow in his footsteps. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. Imitate me, Paul says, just as I also imitate Christ. So we have a great method. Now let me explain to you what evangelism is. Evangelism is three words. E.V., is the message. EV stands for EU, eulogy. That's the message, the, me the good news, good news. The angel is the messenger. And the ism is the study that you use. Everybody uses a study, a method, when they study with people, don't they? Some people say, well, I use the Bible when I study with people. Yes, you do, and you should, and you better. But you still have a method of going about it. You just don't ramble all over the place. And so having a method that they can stick to helps. That way they don't go from Genesis to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Revelation, and you haven't accomplished anything. The first thing is congregational use. I hope that you will take these books and that you will uh, take two quarters and go through them in this congregation either on Wednesday night or on Sunday morning. And at the end of the third lesson, you'll turn to one another. Wednesday nights are really the best time to do this. You'll turn to one another and practice on each other. After the end of three less each at the end of three lessons, the presenter reads the question. Take turns reading the scriptures. The presenter rereads the question. Everyone writes the answer. If it's an incorrect answer, the presenter rereads the scripture and emphasizing the answer. And discussions are encouraged so that you'll know that they're following what you're doing. Now, why, do, why, is, why am I so meticulous about that? Because a lot of people will read a passage of Scripture, and you've heard this in the past, and they say, well, what does that mean to you? And somebody out there said, well, 
I think it says what it means, and it means what it says. Well, that's good enough, brother. Let's go to the next verse. Well, we don't learn anything, do we? And if you study within the context, the Bible will answer its own questions. And that's what you want to stick with is context. So you encourage discussion, but when the presenter reads the question, say like, for instance, how do we get faith? Let's turn to Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17 says what? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, Pete, how do we get faith? We, and then Pete says, well, you know, I like to go out and look at the stars at night, and, uh, and I saw something one time that really increased my faith. Is that how you get faith? <laughs> no. <laughs> Pete, let's look at this again. The Bible says faith comes by what? And continued hearing by the word of God. It's in the continual sense. So in other words, you repeat the question so that they'll learn to get the answer out of the Bible. You'd be surprised when you study with people. They'll be all over the place with answers. You stick with the Bible and the Bible answer its own questions. Never use these three words. They're from the devil. And I mean it. I feel, I want, and I think. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Is that right or wrong? If you say, oh, I feel that this is the way we get faith, then what are you doing? I, you're giving them your opinion. Well, I want this church to have, I want this church to build a hockey rink out in the back. I think that'll help church growth. That's I want. That's the lust of the eye. And then the pride of life is, well, I think if we, got t if we hired 10 more preachers here, we could really grow. I think. I believe. So let the Bible do its own talking. If you don't know something, admit it. I don't know. Write the answer down. But stay with the outline when you study from uh, an outline book. And remember, the power is not in this book. The power is in the Word. The power's not in you and me and our, our ability for persuasion. It's in the Word of God. Always pray. Pray before, during, and after a Bible study. And you may plant and water. You may even harvest. But who gives the increase? It's God. Remember. You know something? That's one of the most comforting, reassuring, positive things that I know to tell you about Bible study was studying the Bible with people or trying to get a Bible study. God's working with you. If you'll just go out there, he'll work with you. They may not want a Bible study right then, but you can ask them again later on. And you can be the kind of example and, the kind, and show the kind of love and care that it'll take to draw them to Jesus. So always remember, you have the one who created the universe on your side. Even if you're scared to death to talk to people, just try it. The Lord will help you. The Lord will help you, especially if you study the Bible on your own every day. <clears throat> the practice run is what we talked about when you're going through this, say, on Wednesday night. After every three lessons, then go through it with each other. And I, I would strongly suggest you doing this uh, in the Spanish-speaking class and also in the English-speaking class. Why is it important to practice on each other? Someone tell me. Sir? Well, you'll learn more about God, but it'll also help you to feel more confident when you study with other people. What if uh, Carrie has five Bible, five Bible studies a week going on, seven Bible studies a week going on. 
and one of them is baptized, who's going to follow up with him? See, Carrie, Carrie would have to uh, pull back on those other six studies. So if you can prepare yourself to study with other people, then you can do the follow-up with this book. There's 16 lessons in here, and it teaches about uh, every aspect, not every aspect, but most aspects that are fundamental to being a child of God, to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. So if you're going to do it as a, as a church and you're going to use this, then please spend two quarters going through this. It will not only help you learn to study with other people, but you will learn some things as well as you go through this. And then also for new Christians use. If we don't follow up with new Christians, we're going to lose them. Do you know what the retention rate is in the churches of Christ in America today for new Christians? What percentage? Anyone want to guess? 10%. I mentioned it yesterday, didn't I? <laughs> 10%. That's not good. But if we will study with them and help them, we can, we can do about 60 to 70%, or God can. We can't do anything. But what did that uh, resolve say that you took home last night? I can do all things through him that gives me strength. Now, I brought a hundred of these so that you'll have enough. But also, are there people here from other congregations? Okay, what congregation are you from? In FAR. I used to know a guy, I went to school with a guy that went to FAR. His first name was Dwayne. It was, in the, it was in the late 70s, early 80s. Do you know a Dwayne? He wore glasses. He was kind of tall and thin. He's probably ugly and fat by now, but I didn't. <laughs> anyway, y'all are welcome to take what you want from these books, too. And if any of you run out, we will send you more free. So uh, we want to... Uh, uh, we want to help you in that. And, to, and, are you, and if you're planning to come back tomorrow night, we'll also give you a habanero kit that you can take home and work with. Uh, there are 16 foundational lessons. And uh, just look at the first one. They're, they're very easy. They take about 30 minutes to go through. So if they have other questions they want to ask, you'll have plenty of time to discuss it. You don't want to keep them too long when you go through a Bible study. If you go two hours in a Bible study, you're probably going to lose them. People like to get in and get out today. Now, look at number two. A disciple is a student, someone who follows a great teacher at all costs, a trainee, a pupil who imitates his master in all things, or all of the above? What's the answer? E, all of the above. That didn't take much, did it? Who is your master or great teacher or rabboni? Jesus is, right? What are the three requirements for being a disciple of Christ? He who would come after me, let him first... Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What's the first thing you imagine that comes to your mind when you imagine a cross? Death. Death. You are going to die. It might be pain and painful and excruciating. Sometimes they were up on there for a week before they died. And it was horrible. It, it was such a horrible experience that it incited sympathy even by some of the Roman soldiers. Jesus didn't take that long to die because they beat him to a bloody pulp before he was taken and put on the cross. And so they're not that difficult of questions and answers. 
probably the most difficult there is is when it's in Luke 14, 26 through, uh, 26 through 28. That's supposed to be instead of 23. I told you there was a mistake. <coughs> and that is, uh, that is um, whoever does not hate father, mother, sister, brother, for my sake cannot is not worthy of me and that's something people have to deal with I don't hate my wife in the sense that we that I hate somebody but she's a she's a a, a distant second you know second place is about the nearest we can get to that translation but it does mean that you have to neglect you have to neglect them to follow Jesus to a certain extent. Now there are additional sections in this book. If they ask you a question you're not familiar with, what four words are you supposed to use? That's a good question. And write it down. Now lessons five There are two questions that new Christians always ask. Number one is, what about the Holy Spirit? And do we still have miraculous things today? And so there's a special section here on, does the Holy Spirit give people special abilities to do miraculous things today? And it's all spelled out from Scripture. And that will always help you when you're studying with people because they'll always bring it up. The second thing they bring up is in verse 10, especially about the Church of Christ. Why don't you people have music in your church? I hate it when they ask that question. <laughs> We're the most musical people that there are because if you don't use a mechanical instrument, it's you, your voice that comes out. Who do you think they, who do choir teachers go after? If they find out uh, one of their kids is a member of the Church of Christ, they just hone right in on them because they know they have to sing a cappella. By the way, what does the word a cappella mean? A means in the manner of, and coppola, it's a Latin word, means chapel in the manner of the chapel or the way the church did it it was used uh several times especially around uh around 12th century a.d when the uh, western church and the eastern church split and one of the main splits was over instrumental music and we're having splits today in the churches of Christ. We shouldn't. People love to hear a cappella music. Do you know what happens to a church when they bring in uh, an instrument or even a choir? People quit singing. I want to tell you a wonderful story. In Hillsboro, Ohio. They have 17 churches of Christ in a county of 30,000. 17 churches of Christ. But 15 of those churches are leftovers from the Civil War. And they've had musical instruments now for 150 years. Well, this one brother started a church of Christ there. And then he had a big tent meeting and got some a bunch of people from Nashville to come down and they sang and people from the community came and they were so impressed that several leaders from the from the churches of Christ instrumental came and talked with that brother and they said I've never heard singing like that in my life especially with or without an instrument if we turn the instrument off you couldn't hear anything people can't say we've forgotten how to sing is what one of them said. And not only that, but they had also forgotten what baptism was. A lot of things they had forgotten. 
Did you know that two of those churches have since taken the instrument out and gone back to being the church of our Lord? And more are considering it. Isn't that wonderful? Because he stood up for what God wanted in worship. And so pages 30 through 32 explain why, actually through 35, I think, explain why we don't use mechanical instruments. Look at verse, you look at page 34. What does that, what does that picture look like to you? And don't say a catcher's mitt. <laughs> what does that picture look like to you? Looks like a harp, doesn't it? That's your larynx. A little bit smaller than that. But that's your larynx. And the wind from your lung goes through those biological strings, we'll call them. And that's how you make tones and sounds. And if you know how to sing, and you set up straight, and you sing, and you have your feet on the floor, and you open up your head, that's one good thing about these songs on the, on the screens is it helps us to open up our head. When we had psalm books, we're down right here, and it closes off your sound. So watching on the screen really does help the singing and the sound in the congregation. Do y'all use that for, a, for a, uh, I saw some words, I didn't see any music, but I saw a lot of people using their books. But if you put music on there, people will quit using their books and they'll hold their head up. And here's another thing that's very important to singing a cappella. Water. It's like oil to a car. When you, when you come in to sing, you want to uh, get some water before you sit down. Because if you don't and you sing too loud, you could hurt your voice. Another thing is you want to learn to sing from the back of your throat. Now, when you eat jalapenos, do you eat them on the tip of your tongue? Well, maybe some of you do. <laughs> I don't know. I can't. I was always taught to eat, if you eat a jalapeno, especially the seeds, you eat it toward the back of your tongue, right? That way it doesn't burn you as bad. And so... Um, well, I found the best thing at H-E-B. It's this thing that's it's got it's supposed to be guacamole flavored jalap uh, habanero stuff. Man, I went to eat it. Where did we eat at this morning? Monterey, right next to Jalisco's. We ate breakfast there, and I put that stuff all over my eggs. I was singing and dancing all the way back. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but anyway, <laughs> it's good. My wife doesn't like those hot things, but she'll eat some hot stuff. Anyway, the point is, God gave you two instruments to use, your voice and your heart. And when we do a, a singing workshop, we work on both of them. And that'll be down the road if you want us to do it. So anyway, those are the two most popular questions that new Christians ask. So you'll have that to help you when you study the foundations. Now another thing that's very important is involving new Christians. One of the biggest problems is, is that we're happy with the new Christians just coming to worship service and giving their money and just sitting there and listening for about 10 years before they get up and have to do something. No, uh-uh. We need to start involving them immediately. So after every single, after every single lesson is an involvement section. Look at after lesson number one. Get involved. Make time each day for Bible study. Start out by reading at least a chapter a day. Start with Genesis. Why do you start with Genesis? Sir, it's the, it's the beginning, and you want them to get, you want them to be 
kind of familiar with the Old Testament. Get get some get their sea legs on before they hit the New Testament running, because most of our sermons are out of the New Testament. So, and uh, even if the reading is difficult, like genealogy, so on begets so and so and so on. Look for something that catches your attention, then underline it, highlight it, put a wow by it, or place a question mark by it. There's some pa- I've been reading in Jeremiah, and there's some passages I'm putting an ouch by it <laughs> because of the things that God said he's going to do to them. Don't be afraid to make notes in your Bible. It's not, it's not a, 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 to be put on your table and in pristine condition. Mark it up. Ask questions or do your own research. The website, BibleHub.com, can give you a lot of information. But do not, capital letters, take a commentary's, co- commentator's word alone. Make sure everything in the context lines up with your interpretation. Not that your interpretation forces the context, but make sure that what you're reading in the context dictates your interpretation. Make sure everything in the context lines up, and after you have studied, then pray back to God what you have learned. When you were in school, did your teacher ever say, okay, and she taught you some math, say, okay, uh, Bobby, uh, tell me what I just told you. Well, that's a good practice to do. After you've studied your Bible, then pray back what you learned to God. Okay, so... Involving them. It not only, the next lesson involvement section has to do with them looking up things about the Church of Christ. We have a two, almost a 2,000 year history. We follow the original pattern that they did 2000, almost 2,000 years ago. No other group does that, except there are some small groups out there. There's a Baptist group that does follow that exactly like we do. Uh, The Mormons teach baptism like we do, but the Mormons got their baptism teaching from one of our preachers in the Restoration. Of course, they also teach that you're God God over your own world and that Adam was God and Eve was God's wife. I think I've got that right. Anyway, that doesn't work too well. Now, there are a couple of these that don't work now, unfortunately. Traces of the Kingdom was one of the best websites to go to to learn about the history of the Church of the Christ in England. You can buy the book. It's about $30 uh, from, I don't know, 21st Century Christian or some of the bookstores around the country. It's it's, uh, heavy reading, but you'll be amazed at at our brothers and sisters of Christ and what we had to go through. We were killed and tortured and murdered by the Catholics. Uh, by the, uh, they, they pulled the same stunt that Muslims did. Uh, when they came to England in about the 6th century, if you didn't convert to the Western ideology, the Western church, you were put to death. And the Celtic Church of Christ was very faithful to the Lord's church for many years. And as they grew, later on they were called other names, Lollards, Waldicians, people with an evil spirit. We've been lied about, accused, falsely accused, and hated for many, many years. And we always will be. Remember that. We always will be. Uh, so uh, some of these, though, are still uh, the Voice of Truth International is an article about the church in Azerbaijan where the wise men came from. And they've had members of the church there for nearly 2,000 years. It's a great article. Brother J.C. Schultz read into him. Then lesson number three has another get involved section. And then they have one on prayer. And then when you get to teaching, there's a section on uh, if if you're, uh, you know, go in and, and be involved in a Bible class. Be a Be a co-teacher and learn how to teach a Bible class. We don't want them just to sit there. We want them to get involved. We need more teachers in our Bible classes, don't we? Uh, It gives them scriptures to to look up while they're taking the Lord's Supper. Uh, It tells them a lot of things that they can do. Uh, Men, it comes to the point where where you're in the 
uh, needing to wait on the table. Uh, that's one of the uh, get involved sections. And then of course, when you get to evangelism, they can be your best uh, ev uh, soul winners because they've got family in the area, a lot of them do, and you wanna follow up on all those people. And then the last one I think is a new standard and that's the matters of the heart. And then on the last page, lesson 17, it says it just teaches you how to use the Strong's Concordance, which you can, you can catch a lot of stuff online, but you won't be able to find, like if you're looking for all the places that baptism is used, you're not likely to find that online, but you can find it in the Strong's Concordance or a certain word that you're looking for. And Strong Concordance also has a, uh, a brief dictionary in the back. Uh, s most of it's pretty good. Some of it doesn't really, like agape, they don't really explain what it is. But, but it, it's good. Uh, Strong Concordance is a great tool to learn. And you ought to give the new Christian, every new Christian, you ought to give them a Strong Concordance and uh, a, a, a World Bible School Bible. The Strong's Concordance, if you'll watch the sales, like from CBD, you can get them for under 10 bucks if you order like 10 of them, something like that. Uh, the uh, English Standard Version Bible that the World Bible School puts out is $5. And man, every church ought to have a bunch of them. And if you don't want to use that, I think they have it in the New King James. I like the New King James better because it explains scriptures a little better, but English standard's not bad. Um, <clears throat> then go through it with the student and ask them next week how their involvement section went. Encourage them to go back and do it if they didn't do it. They're not gonna do everything that it suggests doing immediately. It takes time to grow. At the end of the series, have them fill out an involvement sheet. Do y'all have an involvement sheet here for new members? More for present members, okay. But you know that would be a good thing to have as an involvement sheet. And then share how you've grown through the involvement. And warn them of Satan's attacks. We don't do this enough. Satan, the Bible says, John, uh, Jesus says in John uh, 10 and 10, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what Satan wants to do to you, your family, your children, your grandchildren, everybody that you love. That's what Satan wants to do. And he sure wants to drag you down. Warn them of that. One of the parts of the disciples' prayer is, don't lead us not into temptation, which is to say, and don't let us fall off into temptation, but deliver us from evil, that is the evil one. We need to pray that prayer all the time. And you need to warn them that when they come into Christ, they're going to suffer some persecution. Warn them that, of that up front, because it's going to happen. There's a reason that God allows it. When a seed falls into the ground and dies, life springs up from it, and it has to push up through the dirt. If it's just on the top soil or it's in rocky soil, it just shoot up, and then what will happen to it? Sun will, yeah, sun will burn it, and it'll be gone. If it's planted in thorns, the thorns will choke it out. If it's planted in the road, then the birds will come eat it, the devil take it away but if it's planted in good ground and has to push up through that dirt what happens what happens to that plant it grows what roots and it's if you want to stay with the Lord you're going to have to grow roots and that only comes from being persecuted and, and staying with the Lord through tough times um, <clears throat> so really encourage I've even seen a pictures two pictures of a little plant, I don't know what it was, a clover, I think, that was able to bust up through concrete. Can you imagine what its root system must have looked like? Wow. 
That was a determined little fella. And then John 16, 33, these things I have spoken to you that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Are we going to escape it? No. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. As long as God is on the throne, I'm not worried about it. Are you? Now, there are additional helps that we give you to help with the new Christians. One is, you'll, if you want it, we'll start giving it for you. It's called 50 Ways to Love the Father. It's articles that you'll be getting every week. And then the second year will be 50 Ways to Save Your Neighbor, and the third year will be 50 Ways to Make a Visit. But the leftovers will be in that box there, and uh, you'll want to put them in there, because you, especially the 50 Ways to Love the Father, because you'll want to give that to the new Christians every week. And if they don't show up for a couple of weeks, you want to take what they've missed and go to their house and take it to them. You don't want to let them go past two weeks because Satan can get to them. There's also a, a, a group of DVDs called The Greatness of the Lord's Church they can listen to. And then there's a commitment letter that we can send you that when they are baptized, it's kind of a welcoming letter, but they're asked to write a letter to Jesus and put it in an envelope and put their name in it. And we'll tell them that nobody's going to look at this. Just you. Put it in an envelope. Put your name on it. We'll keep it in the church office. And if you ever need it, it'll come back to you. In other words, if they fall away for a year, you go take them that letter of commitment. Let them look at what they wrote. Nobody else will ever see it but them and God. I know a preacher that has done that, that has, ha that has kept the largest percent. He told me 90%. That's hard to believe, but I'll take his word for it. Because they've made that commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, the third thing is also a very important thing, the third way in which you use it. When you hold, a, how many of you hold Bible studies with other people? Okay, what are some of the studies that you use do you use do you kind of have a group of study uh, scriptures that you use do you back to the bible book of john i used to use that jewel miller well they've got those dvds you can show uh, we have one called the rest of the story that we'll introduce you to next year um, there's one called, uh, um, but in that back to the Bible, the scripture chain reference thing, or is that another one? Anyway, so, some people use the We Care Bible. Yeah, so there's all kinds of different isms, methods out there that you can use. Yeah. But uh, when you study with them and they don't obey the gospel, then what do you do? Huh? How? With what? You need a follow-up. This is it. <clears throat> or one of the ways that you can do it. I'll show you how to do it. If they don't obey, don't panic. Okay? You don't want to look like this. Say, I know you want to be a good disciple of Christ, don't you? What are they going to say? No. <laughs> They're going to say yes. Then let's continue our studies with a book called Foundations for Disciples. Same time next week. You see, you just keep studying with them. 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7 tells us that I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It's still on their minds. So neither he that plants is anything nor he that waters, but God who gives the increase. Look at the very, now this has some reminders about salvation in it, especially in chapter 1 and in chapter 4. Look at chapter 1, the very first lesson, very first question in chapter 4. Now you just discussed with them the week before baptism, right? 
and they, they're not ready to obey. In fact, when you study with Catholics, they're not likely to obey the gospel after you talk about baptism. Because a lot of them don't study the Bible. And they don't understand where you're coming from. In fact, more and more people today don't understand where they're coming from. Plus, they also have deep roots in their family that are, that are not going to understand if they come home and said, I was just baptized in the Church of Christ. They said, you did what? So it's going to take some, a little more time. What is the first question? Before Jesus left this earth, he told his apostles how to make disciples. What two things must happen if someone wants to be a disciple? What are they? They have to be go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And if you'll do that, what did he say he'll do? And lo, I'll be with you always, even unto the end of the age. For them, the end of their age was the destruction of Jerusalem. The end of our age is when Jesus comes back. So uh, uh, although the church began on A.D. 33, uh, there's some goofy stuff about A.D. 70 going around there, but don't listen to it. <laughs> listen to what Kerry teaches on that from the Bible. <laughs> I guarantee he knows, he knows what to say. Patience. Many people need more time. Have you ever seen anything more patient than a cat waiting for a mouse to come out of a hole? <laughs> I like that picture. <laughs> Cats are some of the funniest animals I've ever seen. My son has one that's so fat and so lazy. And I preach to him all the time. <laughs> he doesn't pay me any money. And he'll sit there and listen to me preach to him, and then he'll get up and then rub on my leg and walk off <laughs> and, go, and go meow for his can of tuna. Oh, he's so spoiled he's tuna out of a can. Isn't that something? Well, any questions about this? If Usually, if they haven't obeyed the gospel uh, after you get through talking to them about baptism, whatever method you use, if you'll go right into this, and whatever method you use, mention the word disciple and being a good disciple during your study when you're trying to teach them to obey the gospel so that when you get to the end of it, if they don't obey the gospel, then say, I know you want to be a good disciple. That's easy enough, isn't it? And they say, yes, I do. Then let's just keep going. Uh, we've got a book called Foundations for Disciple. First question tells you what you have to do to be a disciple. And then on lesson number four, it talks about, um, well, four and five, but it talks about a new life. If you are a baptized Christian, how is your new life different from your old self, you see? And usually I've seen with most Catholics that I've studied with, they will obey the gospel by the fourth or fifth lesson. They need that time. They really do. And we need to be patient with them, and we need to respect them because they were taught from the ground up, a lot of them were, and they believe very much. I, I studied with one lady that went to Catholic school as a child, went to Catholic nurses school and got her RN degree. We studied when she was 65 years old. Uh, she had never opened a Bible, but boy, that she slept with that um, uh, rosary. And that rosary was her God, pretty much. And we had a tough go. <laughs> she even called me, uh, she even called me a name. <laughs> I won't repeat. <laughs> but you know something? She obeyed the gospel. We were patient with her. She obeyed the gospel, and now she's in Alaska, and she meets in a house church in the Church of Christ, and she's been faithful ever since. What a wonderful story that God did, and so if we're patient with them, they'll, they'll do it. Well, this is some of the ways you can use it, and I hope that you'll look over this. I hope that you'll do it yourself. I hope that you'll do it together. 
It's in English and in Spanish, so there's no excuses. And uh, you can work together on it, and it'll help you a lot, and you can use it uh, if they don't obey the gospel when you do study with them. Well, here's the words to that song that we sang uh, last night. And I hope you'll, uh, I hope you'll sing it with me. Let's learn this song, and, and uh, Mark, maybe you can find the sheet music to it, and y'all can put it up on the screen. Uh, and really learn it, because what a powerful song it is. Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find the way. Few there are who seem to care, and few there are who pray. Melt my heart and fill my life, give me one soul today. Praise God. Let's close. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the for all the precious souls who have come here tonight, who love you with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and their strength. Thank you, Father, for, for Carrie and the great work that he does here for you and all the brethren that do so many things for you, brothers and sisters. Precious Father, what a wonderful church this is because it belongs to you. It belongs to Jesus. And we pray, Father, that Jesus is glorified through this church to this entire town and this entire area and that great things will come from this congregation. Great things, Father, indeed, through their faith, their hope, and their love in you. Bless them and enrich them and help them, Father, through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Tomorrow night we will do the habanero visitation. We'll go through a kit. I'll have a kit for the Spanish, a kit for the English. You found it. All right. Well, God bless you. <laughs> uh, can you email that to me? I'll see if he can email that to me. Uh, is, is it in your song book? I don't think it's in your song book. That's great. Well, we'll use that tomorrow night. Uh, anyway, we'll do the habanera, and that's uh, one of the more important things. And we'll, we'll have one for English-speaking, Spanish-speaking, and for Texans. So we will see you all tomorrow night. Thank you. And if there's another church in the area that wants to come and wants to get a habanero kit, tell them to come on and let me know before tomorrow night. Because we have somebody.